Welcome. You are listening to the Upper Room Podcast. For more information or to donate to this ministry, visit URFellowship.com. rough today, so I'm going to try to make it through through this thing without whispering the whole time. I'm going to do my best. So we're in a uh, number four, part number four of a message series called Renew Your Mind. Uh, we're finishing it up today. Um, and what do we know? What have we learned through this message series? We know that there's a battle going on in every mind. Uh, we know that most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. And really, to change the way you live, you have to change the way you think. And today we're going to end our four-part message series. Today I want to talk a little bit about fear and anxiety. So just to see who's with me here, I'm going to ask a question. So this is a safe space. Um, how many of you would say you, uh, that maybe fear and anxiety have marked your life at a certain level? Anybody? Good. All right. So you're not alone, right? In, in that in and of itself should be helpful, right? Oh, thank God. I was afraid. I was the only one who wrestled with fear and anxiety. No, it was pretty unanimous in here. Most of us have. So we have to do something with fear and anxiety because it is not in line with how God designed us to live. So let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Let's look at what Paul says about this. So here is, uh, in Philippians, Paul is writing from a prison in Rome uh, when he wanted to be preaching in Rome. So he's in a prison. From a Roman prison, he wrote this very encouraging letter to the believers in Philippi. And this is how uh, he, was, he ended his letter, or he was ending his letter. He said this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts, and what else? Your minds, in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think, think, focus on, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Don't just be hearers of God's word, be doers of God's word. Put it into practice. And the peace and God and the God of peace will be with you. So maybe there's some of you, you're worried about, you know, your grades, because if you don't get good grades, you won't get into a good enough college, then you won't have the degree, then nobody will want to marry you, and then you can't have kids, because then you're going to, if you have kids, you're going to have to send them to school, where there are, there are methamphetamines there at school, and then you're going to grow, they're going to need cars, and insurance, and braces, and you're going to have to save for college while you're trying to pay off your college, right? And you're worried because you have a headache, headache which probably means you have a brain tumor. And all of a sudden, life is spinning out of control. Our minds can easily run away from us. So if you've been with us in previous weeks, we've talked about our our key thought, and that is this, that your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts, which is good news if you're thinking on things that are true and lovely and admirable, if you're thinking on God's truth. But the problem is when we're focused on things that make us afraid or anxious, our minds tend to run in a direction that may not be pleasing to God or helpful to us. Why is it that our minds often compound themselves with fear? And here's why. So we've been talking a lot about this brain that God has designed. And in our brains, there's this little almond-shaped portion of the brain that's called the, or it's known as the amygdala. Uh, Whenever you're afraid, your amygdala kicks in. It's in full gear. So the amygdala is a very helpful part of your brain that's wired for survival. It's wired to make us afraid so that, that we run away from things or avoid things that could be hurtful or dangerous to us. It's the part of the brain that's responsible for fear. In other words, if you ever find yourself in a dangerous situation, your amygdala kicks in. And it sends strong doses of of adrenaline to your body. So, for example, if you ever see a poisonous snake, your amygdala says, danger, run for your life. Run. If you're driving and there's somebody texting their way into your lane, your amygdala does its job and says, that's dangerous, swerve for your life. Right? If you're in bed and you hear a loud noise, your amygdala says either hide under the bed or grab that lamp, use it like nunchucks, take out that intruder in your home, right? The amygdala is responsible for your survival, and fear is its tool. The problem is the amygdala is not objective. It's got one role, one function, and that's to protect. 
it is hardwired to protect. That's why this little uh, almond shaped portion of your brain needs help from what's called the prefrontal cortex. This is the logical part of the brain. So this is the part of the brain that speaks up whenever the amygdala gets out of control. So for example, it's in the middle of the night, you hear a noise somewhere, your amygdala says, you're going to die. The prefrontal cortex kicks in and says, no, that's you know, probably just a cat or whatever it is. This is why God gave us the logical part of our brain to work with the amygdala that's pre-wired for survival. Without the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala just responds according to programming. So for example, maybe if you got, uh, if you got bit by a dog when you were young, that may have programmed a fear into your brain, right? And the prefrontal cortex has a very hard time calming that fear. Because to you, it's proven and programmed into your amygdala that dogs are dangerous. So for many of us, our brains have been pre-programmed to respond to triggers that take us into uh, unhealthy zones of worry, fear, and anxiety. So you see something, you experience something, and it triggers a response that leads to fear or unhealthy thinking. In chapter, I'm sorry, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, this is Jesus talking. He says this. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And I don't think most of us have a fear over what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear. Most of us don't. But I think Jesus is actually getting us something even deeper than that. Jesus is talking about how fear and anxiety works. He's saying, be careful what, you've, what value you give certain things. Right? Is your, is your life more than just food? And your body more than clothes? Don't give so much value to those things. The more value you give a specific thing, the more fear and anxiety you will have around those things. So if you hold too tightly to things that you shouldn't be held too tightly to, fear and anxiety will mark that area of your life. <clears throat> so some examples. Money. Money is important, right? Don't worry, I'm not, gonna, I'm not about taking an offering, right? I don't like gold cufflinks. I'm not interested in a private jet. But money is, it's important. We pay rent with it. We buy food with it. We send our kids to college with it, you know? Money is somewhat important in the scope of things. But maybe some of you grew up feeling like you never had enough. That can become a default program thought in your amygdala. So now as an adult, if you make, if you make money too important... You overvalue it. Fear and anxiety are going to mark your life in the area of money. When we're talking about fear and anxiety, what we're really talking about is this. Who, Who or what is ruling your life? If you make money too important, fear and anxiety are going to mark your relationship with money. If you make stuff too important, you will have anxiety around that stuff. You ever notice that when you when you're broke or don't care about your stuff like you do, uh, you don't care about your stuff like you do when you actually have a little bit of money in your pocket or nicer, or nicer stuff. Like for example, we got landscaping done in our front yard this past summer. Uh, Mark Sperling came out, fixed us all up. Looks amazing. <clears throat> Before that, it was like a jungle. It was bad. So we got it landscaped, and now all of a sudden, I don't want my kids running in it. Right? I'm like, don't play in the beds. I didn't care before I got all that done. Now I'm like, get out of there. I'm like, wait a minute. Why all of a sudden do I really care? When things increase in value, they, become, they begin to matter more to us. And you have to be careful. The fear doesn't crop up there. Like if you drive an old hoopty car, you probably don't always worry about every little scratch and every little ding on it. But if you drive a really nice car, you notice those things. Right? So now a hard one. Children. Children are a gift from God. Right? I have a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old. The Bible says children are a gift from the Lord. He has given me the task of protecting, providing, and caring and shaping and leading them. Yes. Can I protect them from all that is dark in the world? Absolutely not. It's scary to have kids because we value them so much. And we're told by the word of God that children are a gift from the Lord. But if you exalt them too much, your fear over them will rob you from the enjoyment of them. Probably suck a lot of laughter out of your household. I believe with all my heart that God delights in the laughter of Christian homes. I mean, gut laughter, like wake up sore kind of laughter. You should work toward that as parents. It's not going to make them disrespect you that you're fun. Jesus is saying, watch your priorities. Watch how you categorize things. When you overvalue things because of programming in your brain, that's called idolatry. 
and now fear and anxiety are going to grow in that area of your life. Then he says he wants you to consider something. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Yeah, I like that. (laughs) The Bible is saying here, if God cares for the birds, if God provides for the birds that are much lesser value than you are, will he not take care of you? I love the next line. Look at verse 27. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? None of us can. He's literally saying here, quit torturing yourself. And look at where he goes next. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He's saying that the weapon that we have been given to fight fear and anxiety is faith that God ultimately is good. And he rules over our lives in a way that's wiser than the way that we can rule over our lives. The next thing he says here is in verse 33. Skip to verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. It's a great line. Here's why. If all of your fears are on tomorrow, you cannot enjoy the goodness and blessing of God in your life today. Right now, my family's healthy. My marriage is going well. We have very little drama in our world right now. And that's awesome. Now, I don't want to be like, well, drama's probably coming tomorrow. Something's going to mess us up. No, it's absurd, it's absurd, right? I just want to be grateful today. I want to be where I am and present and rejoice in the goodness of God right now. And here's where you're really going to, you're going to see the compassion of Jesus Christ. Look at the very next line. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Here's why I think that's super compassionate. You were just given permission to deal with anxiety and fear today. We don't let that be compounded with tomorrow's troubles. We simply stay in today. We go on the offense against our fear and anxiety today. And let me just say it very clearly. Jesus did not say, let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. The angels who appeared uh, before the coming of Jesus did not say, glory to God in the highest, stress, anxiety on earth. They said, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. Paul did not say, be anxious about everything. But while under house arrest, Paul said, Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, every situation, when you're financially burdened, when you're battling with an addiction, uh, when you're fighting against a marital challenge, in every situation, by prayer and by petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, this goes beyond our, our human ability to understand, will guard your hearts In your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious about everything, but in everything with prayer, we present our request to God. And the supernatural peace from heaven will guard our hearts and our minds. So how do we find, how do we experience this heavenly peace of God? We experience it through prayer. Talking to God. The problem is, for so many of us, prayer is is a last resort. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I guess all we can do now is pray. Can you imagine God in heaven going, oh, you're down to me. That's all you got left, huh? That's it? No, prayer's never a last resort. Prayer's always a first line of offense. You can go boldly before the throne of grace to find help in your time of need. God hears your prayers. You do not have because you do not ask. When you go before God, you have an audience with the king of the universe. He hears your prayers. And the great news is not only does he hear, prayer doesn't just move God, but prayer also changes you. Praying to God helps renew your mind. Let me tell you the science behind it. Uh, it's it's in, a, in this brain that God created. A few decades ago, a neurologist believes that our brain didn't change after adolescence. So in other words, after a certain age, they thought your brain was just fixed. We know today that's not true. Our brain is constantly changing. It's evolving. It's rewiring itself. So as we think thoughts, as we experience experiences, our brain is rewiring itself through a process known as neuroplasticity. It's not fixed. 
That's why we talked about these neural pathways. When you think a thought, it's easier to think that thought again, which is good news if you're thinking good thoughts. It's not good news if you're triggered to run from every dog that you see. Your brain is evolving. There's a term known as neurotheology. It's also known as spiritual neuroscience. It's a study of the relationship between the brain and belief in God. This is the study behind what happens to a human brain through prayer. And, and here's the bottom line. Those who study neurotheology have found that prayer changes your brain. Not only does prayer change the, or touch the heart of God, prayer changes the chemistry of your brain. So Dr. Caroline, Carolyn Leaf, who's a, listen to this, who's a cognitive neuroscientist with a PhD in communication pathology and a BSc in logopathy. Logopedics and audiology, who specializes in metacognitive and cognitive neuropsychology. Okay? You get all that? Anyway, really smart lady, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, in a book called Switch on Your Brain, says this. It's been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer a day, I'm sorry, it's been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it could be measured on a brain scan. Prayer doesn't just move God, but prayer also changes us. Just as to- toxic, negative thoughts hurt the brain and program us for unhealthy thinking, prayer heals the brain. It renews the mind. And this is why. In Romans 12, Paul said this. He said, do not keep, be conformed to the patterns or the thought processes or the ways of this world, but be transformed, be made different by the remo- renewing of your mind. God's word renews the mind. Prayer to God transforms your mind. What is worry? You can define worry this way. Worry is the sin of distrusting the promises and power of God. Worry is saying, God, I don't, I don't believe you're good enough to cover this. God, I don't, I don't trust you with this. The bottom line is most fear and anxiety is, simply, uh, is you simply don't trust that God is good. And don't, don't like hide that. Don't lie about that. There's no freedom for you if you can't say, I don't trust you're good. I don't trust that you have my best interests in heart, at heart. I don't trust that you're going to provide for me. I don't trust that you'll be enough for me. So I have to take it and I have to worry about it. It's of no help for anyone to pretend you trust God, right? You need to say it. You need to let the Holy Spirit break you in the confession of it. Then we can deal with fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety are never going to lose their power over you until you can be honest about what drives them. Paul would say this. He'd say, instead of letting my sinful nature control my mind, I want to choose. And here's what I love about this. I'm going to let the logical part of my brain choose that which is spiritual. Because I believe that which is spiritual is eternal. Therefore, I'm going to logically choose to believe what God says is true. I'm going to let my brain choose the truth of the Spirit. This is what Paul said in Romans 8, 5, and 6. He said, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Excuse me. But those who live accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit of life, by the Spirit is life and peace. That's why we take every thought captive. If there's a thought that is inconsistent with God's word, we take that thought captive. We make it obedient to Christ. We demolish every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take those thoughts captive because we will not be dominated by sinful thoughts that are displeasing to God. That take us out of God's will and into a place of fear. Instead, we choose to follow God's truth. We choose to follow His spirit, which leads not to anxiety, not to stress, not to fear, not to panic, but it leads to life and to peace. How? We tell our prefrontal cortex to grab, grab that amygdala by the horns or tail. What, I, don't, I don't know what you You choose. You give your burdens. You give your burdens to God. What happens to me, and maybe this is some of you too, sometimes in a moment of faith, I'll take whatever's worrying me and I'll say, God, I give it to you. Take it, Lord. I put it in your hands. Then the next day I'll go, okay, Lord, you don't seem to be, seem to be doing anything. Um, I'm going to take it back. I'm going to keep it. 
Some of you, I would literally encourage you to get a box, a shoe box, and put God's name on it. Symbolically, and every time you've got a worry, a burden, a concern, your mind races, write that down. Write down what your worry is. Might be your kids, might be your bills that are keeping you up, uh, up at night, might be the fear of the future, might be a relationship. Whatever it is, write it down and put it symbolically in your God box and say, God, I'm trusting you with this person. I'm trusting you in this situation. And then go on with life. And if you want to worry about it at two in the morning, what you have to do is you got to get out of bed, you have to go to your God box, and you have to take that thing out and symbolically say, God, I don't trust you with it. I'm taking it back. Because we're told to cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. And maybe you're thinking, well, that's irresponsible. I mean, well, let's just live in denial. Don't, you know, don't do anything about your problems. Just give it to God. See how that works out when your bills come due. Okay, I'm not talking about living in denial. Okay? This is what I try to do. I want to, when I have a concern, a worry, if there's something I can do, I'm going to do what I can do. In other words, if I've got a health issue, I'm going to eat right, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to go to the, you know, to the best doctors I can, I'm going to do what I can do. If I've got a financial issue, <clears throat> I'm going to make a budget, I'm going to get good advice, I'm going to spend less than I make, novel idea, I'm going to do what I can do. Then what I'm going to do, is I'm going to give God what I can't do. I'm going to do what I can do, and I'm going to give God what I can't do. And ultimately then, I don't, I'm, going to, I'm just going to trust God no matter what. And I'm going to do what I can do, and I'm going to give God what I can't do. I can't heal that person. I can't change that person. I can't control everything. I'm going to do what I can and give God what I can't. And I'm going to trust him. God wants you to have a heart of, at peace, a deep abiding sense of heavenly joy. That is possible. It's also a choice. It's a choice of where you let your mind go. If your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts, do you like where your thoughts are taking you? If not, what do we do? We identify the truth that sets us free from the bondage. And we write it, we think it, we meditate on it until we believe it. We write it, think it, meditate on it until we believe it. I've always loved this verse in Lamentations. By the way, Lamentations is not a book that most people who struggle with fear and anxiety should really spend a lot of time in, but it's a great, it's a great book. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Do you hear that? His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I want to trust that God has the mercy in the, uh, and the Holy Spirit has the power to bring me through my fear and anxiety today. And I'll go to bed and I'll sleep well tonight. And get up and there will be new mercy there. Because the mercies of God never run out. You are not a hostage to your unhealthy thoughts. The weapons that you fight with are not the weapons of this world. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. <clears throat> you take everything that is not of God, every pretension, and you demolish it. You take every thought captive and you make it obedient to Christ. Worry's not your master. You trust in God. His peace guides and guards your heart, your mind, and your soul in Christ Jesus. You're not a slave to your habits. You're not a prisoner to an addiction. You've been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's light. You can't always control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. You don't interpret God through your circumstances. You interpret your circumstances through the goodness of God. And you bathe everything in prayer, because you're not anxious about anything. But in everything, you present your request to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus. Because when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Amen? Amen. So Father, today, set us free. Renew our minds, God, with your truth. <clears throat> God, I thank you that there are people being set free by the truth in the power of your word in the glory of your presence. We thank you, God, that in your goodness and in your sovereignty that there is a peace from heaven that goes beyond our ability to understand or even explain, that, that will land on us, will settle on us, and renew us 
and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> God, may we fall so in love with you, uh, talking to you, walking by faith, not by sight, praying continually, constantly aware, aware of your presence. So much so, God, that, that you renew our minds. Give us the mind of your son, Jesus. Give us the heart uh, to do your will. Give us your word to direct your, our steps. Pray that all that we do would be pleasing to you. It's in your name that we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. All right. The ministry team wants to come forward. If you like prayer for any reason, if you struggle with fear and anxiety, man, prayer, come get prayed for. Amen, you're free to go.